Good evening, everyone. Glad to have you back. Uh, this is what I consider casual, uh, whatever day it is, Tuesday. All of our markers are gone. Uh, tonight, I'm just going to go review a little bit and, and talk about the end of our story of uh, The Horse and His Boy and introduce our next book, C.S. Lewis book, to you. But I'm going to start with some reflections. If I don't do all of them, I will do some of them at the end after reading the first chapter. But uh, today was a wonderful day. You know, this coronavirus isolation has really gotten to me. And it, if it weren't for my doctors and for my family and some close friends, I don't know how I would survive it. I go up and down every day. And I was, uh, I just, I wasn't able to broadcast a few days this week. and. I'm back and I'll be broadcasting every day from now on uh, up until uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, three and, for tea and uh, seven like tonight. Fireside will continue on a regular schedule at seven. And then <clears throat> Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, tea at four. It's, it's the weekend and tea is more fun a little bit later in the day. And though it will be for children, I will kind of alternate between curating and reading. But uh, probably tea time the rest of this week will be around objects and then I'll go back to the story of the Little Lame Prince uh, and his traveling cloak on um, Saturday and we'll do it for a few days. So tonight when we start off, I discovered something late night uh, laying in bed and woke up at five o'clock in the morning, which is usually when I get my ideas. I don't know why, it's really irritating, but that's what it is. Sometimes I can go back to sleep, sometimes I can't, but it's like, I don't know if it's prophetic, that may be my own myopia, but it's, it's like a revelation. Tonight I have some things to show you to thank some friends who made this journey much uh, less difficult. Uh, uh, and one of them is being introduced to um, the Berliner Philharmonic. For all of you, if you look at their website, I think they still have a free, it's either a month, I think it's a month or two weeks or a month, free trial. And if you haven't done it, you should do it. It's really worthwhile. And I, last night I was wondering why do I just, and this morning, this morning I had to clean up the kitchen because we had some, uh, my family was here and we, we planted a garden. If you saw the tea time today, I, I did it outside in the garden in between the rain and everything. It's so cold here still. But um, <clears throat> this morning, I was trying to find, trying to make um, my bubble of chaos, as my friend said uh, early this morning in a conversation, into a little bit of order. <clears throat> Sheltering in place, uh, for me sometimes gets helter skelter because it's just the shelter gets disarranged and I have to bring order. So this morning I put on the Berlin front of Mike. I thought well, it would be great to have some music. And then just all of a sudden I realized why I enjoy watching the Philharmonic because there are a couple of, there are about three things it has to do with the body and with people. One is I've never <clears throat> been able to experience, I've, I've sat up close in symphony orchestras at Kennedy Center, different places, and that's been fun. And I love doing that. And on our anniversary last year, it would have been our anniversary, I walk up to Kennedy Center, this is so magical, and I wanted to buy a ticket, and this woman said, here, I have one that was turned in, go. And I sat in the third, about fifth row, center side, uh, next to the most amazing African-American poet that came looking like he came right out of the Harlem Renaissance with a straw hat. He was probably 90 and he was the most amazing, good looking man. Had just a wonderful conversation and a wonderful concert and being up that close was such an amazing experience and I think that's why I like watching it on my iPad because the Berlin Philharmonic, the, the filming, the camera work is just brilliant. You actually see different musicians interacting with each other, plus you can see the conductor, you can see the music pouring down through his bodies and their bodies. It's just like this, it's like we talk about the body of Christ being one in each other. That's what you see when you have this musical experience because they are so good and they're so professional. And again, as I've said before, it's such a miracle to see uh, a country like Germany who has been so downtrodden and also so evil 
and who produced Luther and Bach and Handel and all kinds of people and also Hitler and I think Karl Marx too maybe anyway <clears throat> I just uh, it's a miracle and it's redemptive and we were talking I was talking with my friend Josh this morning when he's the one that coined the term uh, bubble of chaos and as we talked I wanted to share it with you before we go into the Rabidash and the rest of the book and in the beginning uh, he was saying, you know, uh, he gave me a, a sports uh, illustration. He said, when I play basketball, the coach said, there's a lot that you have no control over when you're on the court, but you need to forget about yourself and just focus on what you're doing right at that moment. And I realized the last few nights, uh, because of my isolation, I've been able, after my programs, I've been able to sit in here and keep the fire going and just kind of, especially yesterday on Sunday, I was able to just sit, or whenever Sunday was. <laughs> yeah, it was the day before yesterday. Just sit for a long evening and just be in the pre be in just sitting in the present. It's a hard thing to do. We're not used to it because we've been addicted to quote unquote busyness. We think we're victims of all the busy things we have to do, but we're not. We choose to do that. And we choose to let it become uh, out of control. If there's anything that's been good about this disease and this tragedy is that it can be redemptive if we're creative. Remember I showed you the portrait of how we think we should look and then the back was fresh paint, how God wants us to see it. I just want to challenge you all <clears throat> to be positive and begin to be creative and to set into place things that you would like to remain once the uh, bands are lifted. I think it's a really worthwhile thing. And there's th there small things and big things and other things you can do, like my family helped me plant a garden. We're going to share it with our neighbors and with all of my family and cousins if they come. So there's, there's, just, um, there's just a lot of creative. This is a time to be creative, and it's a good way to um, chase off the spoils of the discouragement and depression and loneliness. Uh, I'm going to, I got some things in the mail. There's nothing worse during this time to go to the mail and not even, uh, going to my P.O. box and having not even any junk mail. At least I had a roommate once who was very strange and he always said, I love getting junk mail because I, I know that somebody knows I exist. Well, that's kind of how I feel. Anyway, so um, I'm going to read this story and then, and well anyway, to finish Josh's comments, he said, his coach said, uh, the only thing you can do is control the controllables. There's no way you can know the outcome, whether you're going to win or be defeated. And I was over getting some uh, lunch with uh, our family. We, uh, the closest thing we can get to having lunch together when it's raining, no place to sit that's dry or warm, can't go in each other's house. So the only thing we can do is get carry out and roll down to our windows closest to each other and talk with the heaters on our car. And <laughs> that, that was, you know, six feet away, but that's it. That's all we can do. And it really gets hard to not be able to touch because I'm very touchy and an extrovert. And uh, I was talking to a friend the other day and I said, well, my, fr my friend Ben said, well, you know, <clears throat> for introverts, this is just kind of ordinary behavior. And I was saying it to another friend, and she says, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. She said, I'm an introvert, but you know what? Even introverts get frustrated because they know, like if they enjoy being by themselves, they know that they can go out and find somebody when they really want to. And it's working the same on introverts as it is on extroverts. It becomes a prison because you just cannot have contact with other people. We all need people. That's what God created us to be, creatures that need each other. So I'm hoping that uh, <clears throat> in this time we can be focused and disciplined. Uh, my friend Josh said, there's, he's referring to a book, I don't know the name of it, but it, it was pointed out that um, this is the first generation or two generations where Americans have not had grit. We haven't had any really big suffering and the greatest generation, World War II, Vietnam, coming back in defeat, and those people knew grit. And um, 
are a lot, you know, like after World War II, I grew up right after, I was a little before the baby boomer, but I was in there and uh, nobody wanted us to have anything difficult. So our parents would protect us. So do the baby boomers, they protect us from anything real or, or dangerous or, or sad. We, we try to do that and that's in one way what a parent tries to do to protect his child, but it's also unfair because you don't build grit unless you have some challenge. And that's where I think God is in all this. I don't think that uh, God ever causes evil. I don't, there's no way to answer why evil still exists. Except you can do it in your head, biblically, and look at prophecy. But other than mentally, you can't really wrap your heart around that. Because <clears throat> how could a good God, your heart says, a good God, if he's really good, would not let people to suffer. And that's a valid point, and I think it's true. But there are a lot of things we don't understand in this life, and we will someday. And it's the waiting until someday that takes grit, and that's what we need to be doing. And in the meantime, planning and doing things that we can do. Like my folks, I, I mentioned today a bit, and I'm mentioning it now, this will be the last time. My folk, <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> you don't believe that. I don't lie, it's just that I repeat myself. Uh, uh, you know, my, my parents were older, they were in their almost 50 when they adopted me, and I was born in 1942. So, my dad was too young to go to World War I and too old to go into World War II, and needed for, uh, needed, he was needed for peacetime things. He did electrical wiring and all kinds of things. And my mom went through, the, well, they both went through the um, Spanish flu epidemic. They were just um, not even a year apart, born in 1900 and just a little bit over 19, 1901, a few months later, my dad. And, you know, their parents went through all of those things, the flu epidemic, dirt farming with no money during the Depression, and yet they came out and they were steadfast and they had grit and they applied themselves and made the best of where they were. So to me, that's what being redemptive is. If we can, as, as a, <laughs> I went and got some pots for the garden and this woman said, well, I think the coronavirus, I had to return them. And there was a very strict policy, nothing can be returned because of the coronavirus, especially if you take it home and then bring it back. And, um, big sign no returns and I you know again we're in a throwaway society we're so used to being able just to go shop and buy a whole bunch of things and then just take them back we have the freedom we have the problem in our culture is we have too much multiple choice we have too much freedom of choice and we begin to think that we're all powerful well we aren't obviously now and we there's no way even if we control the controllables in our lives that we may end up <coughs> doing it doing well or or surviving or dying we could die from the uh, the virus if they don't get a cure we could die from the virus and if they don't get testing better we could maybe get it and then if we all stick around and no businesses are operating we'll end up starving because the the supply lines are being broken and the chain the supply chains are being disrupted by people getting sick and not and companies not being able to make money uh, there was an interesting article I mentioned it today I mentioned it again on Germany and Italy and they, they compared why were there more deaths um, and the virus in Italy than in um, Germany it's a very simple simple solution or explanation and I'd never thought about it, it was economic the Germans had grit because they had to go through, they were humiliated in World War I. Hitler took advantage of that and communism took advantage of that. And uh, then <clears throat> in World War II, Hitler took over and they were humiliated again by, by betraying their own people. Plus, we made sure that Hitler, his evil would go away. And again, here is redemptive behavior and grit where we make sure that we can do everything we can to keep evil from prevailing within our, well, not just within our borders, but that, that involved the whole world. And I think we're beginning to come to the, the realization that China is not our friend. It's good to cooperate, but 
they're a world power that want to overtake us. And they don't have any qualms at all getting rid of thousands of people. I think that, if the truth be told, there's probably a lot more deaths in China than they're admitting. They never admit any. People are totally disposable. Here, um, a lot of values are disposable because we have too much and we have multiple choice and we think we can recreate ourselves when we only have one person that created us, one power that created us, and that higher power wants us to follow in what he has called us to be as, as created children of his. So, you know, where, wherever we come out on this, I don't know. But we can have courage and, and an optimistic and positive attitude. My folks went through all of those things and yet, and they were a small business owner, they had lots of struggles, I remember a lot of them. But the fact is they put me through college, I had a new car when I was 16, probably indulgent because I was the only child they had and I was adopted and they tried to get me a brother and he, I'm not exaggerating, he tried to kill me so they got rid of him, had to, took him back to his, his father. And so they just decided that's it, they're gonna have just me and that's, that's it. So they poured an awful lot into me and yeah, I probably was spoiled compared to the, well definitely spoiled compared to the rest of the world. But life isn't easy even if you have all kinds of um, material benefits. And I didn't have all kinds, but I, it was certainly more than adequate and wonderful and loving. So, you know, I think being isolated like this, you begin to think, like my friend, I've said, his library, he said, this is my someday library. He said, all of a sudden I realized now is someday I have to start reading some books. So I've been doing that, actually going through the house and seeing what do I really it's not being, I'll never be a minimalist, as I said today, <laughs> maybe the Victorian minimalist, but um, too much is always enough and good, <laughs> rather than not enough. So going from not enough, too much is not enough, to kind of like, some of my not enoughs was just to, to make up for the dislike I had inside of myself and the lack of confidence I had. And, loving myself and I'm coming to terms with that and this isolation though my psychiatrist said I would never choose this for you but in, in some ways it, it has been redemptive though really, something redemptive is not easy or beautiful or magical like this morning in that conversation we said um, just talking about all these self-help books and I've all of a sudden enjoyed walking I've lost weight things I've always wanted to do, could never do. And uh, like Josh was saying, he says, I'm doing things for myself I've never bothered to do. And so if you build those things in now, that's grit. Disciplining yourself in a good way, like I like to walk now. I don't, it, like before I remember, oh, I should do this so I look good so people will like me. It's not that at all anymore. I just really love it because I like the way my body is be feeling and I'm trying to get healthier. It's because my family is paranoid about me, my age, getting the coronavirus, and so am I. So I'm trying to take every precaution, and in the meantime, I've started to discover the enjoyment of sitting in the living room and talking to you, having tea with yourself and your kids, and, and just being even by myself, which I've never been able to do. Can't do it for long with this situation, but I can do it for an hour, and then at night, I get to I've decided I'm going to make a regular habit of having a nice Epsom salts bath. I know I sound old, but I'm active all day and it really does help and it helps me to sleep because if I, and I've, I've limited myself to media and to Facebook and things like that and like Josh was saying, he said, how many friends do you need and what kind of friends are they that they friend you on Facebook? There, there is a place for that, there's a value for that and I do reach out to people on Facebook. And I found a lot of you because you're on Facebook and you found me, which is really exciting. People I haven't seen or heard from for years have resurfaced. I have a friend in Germany that for probably 20, well, since the 70s I hadn't heard from him, but then he found me on Facebook and um, we met in Berlin when Abigail and I went to visit her friend there, um, this was a while ago. And he resurfaced again because he saw I was doing the Facebook thing. So there is a value in that. I'm not being negative about any of that. But it's time now for us to create 
not a new normal, not a new life. Just create who we were called and chosen to be and to, to be to fit inside our own skin, to fit in our own body and be who God wanted us to be from the beginning. Because busyness is something you volunteer for, you're not a victim. And yes, you gotta work and have grit and spend a lot of time building things. Nothing is easier comes automatically. I think that's what a lot of um, younger people are realizing. You know, even our, the government at some point runs out of money and they're starting to, and it's not an, a limitless resource. No matter how much taxes you, you put in, uh, it's still limit, there is a limit. So we are in real duck soup, and it's up to us to get some grit and be redemptive in ourselves and our families and our friends and to reach out to people in need. I'm just so conscious of that, that we need to keep doing that, and we need to do that when we're not in this kind of situation. I'm sorry to go on. I'm going to now go back to Rabidash and tell you what how brilliant Lewis is in his observations. His psychological observations are amazing. In fact, there's several books that are written that are all based on uh, C.S. Lewis's insights into the human psyche. Um, and the, it was she's passed away now. Her name is Leanne Payne, and it's called The Healing Presence Through Healing Prayers. One of her books. And there's one about, I um, can't remember the title, it's out of print now, but it was something about the presence, the real presence. And it was the, the presence of God in C.S. Lewis's writing. And her whole thing is, is that you come into the true self that God's created you to be, and that's all within Lewis's understanding. And it's so brilliant. Here he was, a atheist intellectual, teaching at uh, Oxford and then at Cambridge. And God found him. And I identify with him because his mother died when he was young. They were orphaned. Uh, he grew up in a kind of proper English, respectable house and was sent off to boys' school. So he never had a lot of nurturing. And like his, the, at the end of later in his life when he married Joy, the uh, book Surprised by Joy is amazing, where he finally found love. Like I showed, um, I think yesterday, a picture of Twyla and myself when we were um, going to Ireland, when we were expecting Rachel, and I said, that was my first home. I think I should, maybe I showed that to you. In fact, you know what? I have it right here. I'll show it to you. And in fact, I, I'll show you what it was in. There's a book called Castles in the Air, and it's about my ancestral home in Wales. I was, my birth mother was a Gwyn, and the Gwyns were, go back to about 100 AD, and they were the king and queen and prince and princess of Wales. And this is their family castle, and it's a great story. It's about this couple, this artist, kind of not really a pop artist, but a really interesting 70s artist. His wife was a book restorer, and they decided to buy they wanted to get a, what they called a Class A home, which was an old manor house. And they bought the uh, Gwyn family estate and restored it. And it's hilarious. So I advise any of you that I just suggest, if you'd like, it's just really fun to read. Like the fact she came down with three sweaters and four coats. And there were a whole bunch of Japanese tourists in the living room taking pictures. <laughs> so anyway, that's what happens when you live in a manor house. And so I, my whole life has been trying to search for a manor house that would be fitting to my stature. Um, here was my first home, and I showed it, and I'll show it one more time. That was my first home. Twyla and I had been married five years, and we were on our way. Uh, our friends, Greg Mitchell and Eric Weichart, and their, their wives surprised us with a limo at the uh, train station. He stayed in an apartment in Chelsea that belonged to a, an actor who was quite popular at the time, and then uh, left and went to, and then took the plane the next day and went to Ireland. And as I said, being pregnant in Ireland is an amazing thing. It was at least in the 70s because it was so depopulated. Any pregnant woman, if you got a taxi, they would treat you like a queen. They'd have you sit down, like honoring the Virgin Mary and wait. 
<clears throat> come around and help you in the car. So anyway, that was my first home. <clears throat> and I remain looking for it until I see her in heaven. That's my next home. In the meantime, I'd love to live in a manor house. <laughs> All right, let's go. So here we're going back just a little bit to the end of the story last night, because that's where Rabidash comes in. This is who we're going to talk about. There was a short silence, and then they all stirred and looked up at one another as if they were waking from sleep. Aslan was gone. But there was a brightness in the air and on the grass, a joy in their hearts, which assured them that he had been no dream. And anyway, there was the donkey in front of them. King Loon was one of the kind, was the kindest hardest of men, and on seeing his enemy in this regrettable condition, he forgot all his anger. Remember, the sentence was they weren't going to kill um, kill him, Rabadash, but the, the curse was that um, he he could go home and he'd be a captive in his own temple and palace, and if he ever left it, he would turn into a donkey. So we'll go on now. Your Royal Highness, okay, let's do that. King Loon was the kindest hardest of men, and on seeing his enemy in this regrettable condition, he forgot all his anger. Your Royal Highness, he said, I am most truly sorry that the things have come to this extremity. Your Highness will bear witness that it was none of our doing. And of course, we shall be delighted to provide your highness with shipping back to Tashkan for the er, treatment which Aslan has prescribed. Now, do you remember what Aslan prescribed? And that was what happened, that he, was turned, he would be turned into a donkey if he uh, went back. You shall have every comfort which your highness's situation allows, the best of cattle boats, the freshest carrots and thistles. How about that? But a deafening bray come, came from the donkey, and a well-aimed kick at one of the guards made it clear that these kindly offers were unregrettably received. Ungratefully received, not regrettably. And here, to get him out of the way, I better finish the rest of the story of Rabidash. That's the writer, Sir Lewis. He, or it, was duly sent back by boat to Tashban and brought into the Temple of Tash at the great autumnal festival. And then he became a man again. But of course, four or five thousand people had seen the transformation and the affair could not possibly be hushed up. And after the old Tisroch's death, when Rabadash became Tisroch in his place, he turned out to be the most peaceable Tisroch our man had ever known. This was because, not daring to go more than ten miles from Tashban, he could never go on a war himself, and he didn't want his Tarkins to win fame in the wars at his expense. Still self-centered. For that is the way Tisrochs get overthrown. But though his reasons were selfish, it made things much more comfortable for all the smaller countries around Kalerman. His own people never forgot that he had been a donkey. During his reign, or to his face, he was called Rabidash the Peacemaker. But after his death and behind his back, he was called Rabidash the Ridiculous. If you look him up in A Good History of Kalerman, try the local library, Lewis suggests, you will find him under that name. And to this day in coloring schools, if you do anything unusually stupid, you're very likely to be called a second rabidash. That's a fate worse than death, I'd say. Meanwhile, at Anbert, everyone was very glad that he'd been disposed of before the, the real fun began which was a grand feast held that evening on the lawn before the castle with dozens of lanterns to help the moonlight. And the wine flowed and the tales were told and the jokes were cracked and their silence was made and the king's poet with two fiddlers stepped out in the middle of the circle. Erebus and Corpo prepared themselves to be bored for the only poetry they knew was the Calermine kind. You know, 
and you now know what that was like. But at the very first scrape of the fiddles, a rocket seemed to go up inside their heads, and the poets sang the great old lay of Fair Olden, and how he fought the grand fire and turned him into a stone. That's the origin of Mount Fire. It was a two-headed giant, and won the lady lone for his bride. When it was over, they wished it was going to begin again, and so on and so forth. And it talks about Bree and Lucy and all that. So this, the secret discovery that I found is that Rabidash, Lewis is talking about himself. He's talking about the false self and the true self. And I think, because you know, uh, Rabidash was really angry. He was always angry at everyone. And a lot of us, if we don't love ourselves, that's why Jesus said, you must love others as you, you love yourself. When we're away from God and when we try to create our own persona and image and portrait, self-help, like a lot of substitute, a lot of um, churches and, and Christians have published lots of self-help books, but the whole idea of self-help is totally, again, we can recreate ourselves in our own image. It's, it's the wrong place to start. And I think this is why Lewis is talking about Rabidash. It's just brilliant. Because as long as he stayed in his temple, and it wasn't in his place, it's not sheltering in place, it was as long as he was connected to the temple of Tisroch, to God, he was a man. As soon as he got outside that, he was a donkey. And I think there's a lot to be said for that, and I think it, especially for someone as brilliant as Lewis, um, he was able to see that his intellectual prowess was like a donkey without God's power. And so, um, Leanne Payne has these wonderful books about, uh, it's about inner healing through prayer. And it's based exactly on this kind of insight that Lewis Gives. And it's so interesting because he was such a dry intellectual before, when he was an atheist, before he believed. And then he, he was, it's so brilliant because he could tell it through children's stories. He realizes that in the West, in the Western Church, we've chosen the mind over the heart. The Eastern Orthodox tradition is much more heart oriented and less mind. As one uh, person said, we choose relationship over philosophy. And you can see the, um, the dregs of Greek philosophy through Roman times down to us in the Western Church, and it's different in the Eastern Church to a point. We're all broken, and God's Church is full of broken people, but there is redemption within that brokenness. So I just challenge you tonight to think about Rabidash. How, how is he in relationship to yourself? And I had a really, to think I really lost my mind, I thought I was too. The, um, yesterday morning I woke up and I have a slag glass lantern, it was a hall light. And I had it in our last house with Twyla, which we call Glenfeather Hall. It was really a magical place, not because there were spooky things going on, but birds would make nests around our door and uh, a dogwood, which is my, my mother's favorite tree. Uh, a friend was going to give me a tree to, in her memory. She does a lot of it in Israel, but she's going to give a tree for a garden. Never got around to it. And the next spring, after my mom passed away, a little sprig popped up and it became this beautiful dogwood tree, naturally. It's like God's gift to me and to our family. And Rachel and Abigail and Twyla all called it Grammy's tree. And we had our ceremonial burial of her dog underneath it. And Abigail, I think, I don't know how old she was. She was really young and she was carrying, she loved Jiggy, he was a little black toy poodle. She was carrying him around, miniature poodle, and he's carrying her, him around. And so I dug a trough because we had to put him to sleep. He was really sick. <laughs> Abigail took him and put him and he put him in the trough where we were going to bury him, and he just stood in there looking kind of bewildered. She wanted to make sure it was going to fit. <laughs> so anyway, that was under Grammy's tree. So there's just there's always a redemptive place somewhere in the midst of suffering, and 
I'm just hoping, I just want to encourage you to find it, whether it's creating beauty in your home, putting things in special places, using things you haven't used. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple more things, and we'll go over to the last reflection. I think we're going to have to wait till tomorrow night to start the next book. We'll be doing the first chapter tomorrow night of um, Prince Caspian, the next book in the series. And uh, anyway, so I'm going to show you a few more things, and then I'm going to go show you one more thing that has to do with this story. So part of what I'm saying tonight, and part of my conclusions and observations about Lewis through this book, comes from somebody who loves Lewis. And again, here's somebody that I haven't seen for many years. He's been so encouraging to me, and when I was not really very well off myself, good, good inside, he told me just recently I was really encouraging to him and he never forgot it. I, I wasn't even aware of it. And his name is John Lucky, and I just want to plug his book. It's really wonderful. I've started reading it. And it's called Relationships, The Real Estate of Heaven. And I want to read something in here because this is a book for right now, especially for us being isolated from other people and how how do we maintain relationships when we can't see each other, can't touch? And um, there's, um, there's a whole chapter on loving God and loving self and others, and uh, my longest walks along the way. And uh, there's a wonderful, I mentioned this last night, I didn't have music deliberately tonight because this is a casual dress down night and conclusions over the last book. Um, Ocha 8, I, I mentioned it last night. Look it up. They have, they're introducing their new album. It is just amazing. And there's a song on it called The Road Home and The Long Way Home. It's just so beautiful and poignant. And it's interesting that Lewis, just to divert, Lewis, part of him getting in touch with something that's numinous rather than just the mind was the works of Mahler, Mahler symphonies. The... Uh, the great muddy, <laughs> mysterious mud of Mahler and, the, and, and Zelda and all kinds of people and all kinds of German myths, Nordic myths. So that was where he began to, to touch the holy, the, the numinous, the non-material, the non-brain controllable part of life. And um, I'm going to read you what, what Jack John, Jack, says. It's just so wonderful. My title, Relationships, The Real Estate of Heaven, is the basic premise being that God, what God values most is relationship. He goes on to say how he discovered it. And, and then explains uh, how he discovered it through a sermon and then his miraculous connection with God through a bicycle story. I haven't read The Bicycle Story yet, but my daughter Abigail and Nathan actually knew Jack Lucky in a, a, a discipleship group at the Falls Church, so he's, he's local. He left, now lives in Florida. But I really encourage you to get the book. It's very inexpensive, and it's just one. It was a gift to me, and it's just so timely. I can't believe it. So, in the subsequent pages, I will include much about how God uses projects, tasks, quote-unquote, in which we are invited to join him with the purpose of bringing us closer to him and to our neighbors. This book is my latest task. It is my hope that the, the reader will find this interesting but also helpful in understanding how God leads us in developing our relationship with him and relationships with others. And I think it's so profound because I've found like my family coming out and helping me build a garden, a victory garden that we're all going to share, even with our neighbors and our family. It's these quote-unquote tasks that we're doing while we're in uh, prison <laughs> that um, we can build our relationships with others and with God and, and really become aware, I've become aware of people that care for me that I never thought even knew who I was. I'm still not aware of one person who left daffodils on my porch on Palm Sunday. 
I don't know if it's a secret admirer or just a secret friend or whatever. I've asked everybody under the sun I can think of that it would be appropriate to do. And one, one friend I thought for sure was the person, she said, well, that's exactly what I would do in character, but I didn't do it. So I still don't know. I, never, I may never know. Maybe it was from God. I don't know. You know could be. But this morning, I, I didn't finish. There's this slide glass lantern. And I thought, I'm really losing my mind because I look at the thing all the time and I've never looked at the patterns. But there's a definite pattern on one side after reading Rabidash and all this. On one side, there's a definite pattern and it looks like an angel uh, blessing almost Mary, but it looks like it's it could be anybody blessing someone, a human. And then I looked at it again this afternoon. Excuse me. And I saw it again and it was... There was an angel in the background, but it was two people reaching out toward each other. And I thought, that's really interesting, numinous parallel for what we've been talking about and what Jack is talking about. So then I go around the corner and look at the, the next one, and I was really freaked out. I started looking at it, and it looked a lot like a donkey looking at me. I went, what? First I thought it was a dog. But no, it's a donkey. But then if I looked at it closer, there's another figure there where like the donkey kind of fades and the person I see is, or the animal I see is this most elegant greyhound our friends Steve and Missy Timmy have. It's the most elegant, beautiful dog. It's so French, it's disgusting. <laughs> and it's aesthetically, it's perfection and aesthetics, that dog. It shows how beautiful creation is the way God made it. Anyway, so I kind of went back and forth to those things, and then I came downstairs, and I explained to this, this to you a few weeks ago. I have an icon of Christ holding the scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the thing about looking at icons is, is they look at you. you. You sit in front of them to listen to them, because they represent the real presence of whoever it is that's there. So it can be, becomes the real presence of Christ. In the Western Church, it's not, it's not minimizing it. It's the same in the Eastern Church, but the Western Church, we kind of funnel it through the administration of priests through the blood and wine. And that's the same in the Orthodox Church, but it's sort of a different mode. It's through authority and through the priesthood that we experience God's love and God's mercy and His judgment. In the Eastern Church, it's looking at the presence of saints and looking at Christ and, and looking in a way that they, you allow them to see you into your heart. It's a heart thing. The other is a mental thing. Like the Roman Church explains exactly how the bread and wine works. And, and in the, it's not less in the Eastern Church, but it's all about listening and looking and allowing something to come into the heart, not the brain, not understand it. Like in the Western Church, the communion table where the Eucharist is served is often to re referred to as the wedding bed, the wedding chamber. Well, all of that's the same in both, but it's just a different thing. It's an intellectual understanding of why the bread and wine exists. It's something to do with matter, which is based on um, Greek and Roman thinking, and especially Greek philosophy, and Plato, Platonism. Whereas the early church is closer, I think, in a lot of ways, in the Eastern church. But again, it's looking in the heart, and the heart looking at the saint, and allowing the saint and Christ to look at you. And, and, and I've been looking at that icon for years, and I decided, instead of having it somewhere else, I've got it in the kitchen, right where I sit and do reading and writing and things, because it's the warmest place in the house. And I have another icon, which I'll show you on another curatorial day. It's called my Icon of Truth, and it has a story that goes with it. And the lantern was right near the Icon of Truth in my old house. It was in the entrance hall. The Icon of Truth was right at the door because it was my reality check with God's love and His judgment for me. I'll tell you that story again. I, I know I've told it, but I may repeat it. But this icon... Is, is true to the classical understanding of icons. It was painted by John Snowgren, who went to Kraft, was a uh, constructivist, abstract artist, used junk and did all kinds of three-dimensional things. 
and found Christ and um, became Orthodox, he and his family. And uh, he now is a monk and uh, does icons in the monastery. And the icon with I'm the way, the truth, and the life, the National Gallery had an icon um, exhibit years ago, and they took slides and photographed the icon of one of the really early icons of Christ in Mount Sinai. And I uh, took a photograph of this eye and this eye. And I know when I look in the mirror, I don't know about you, but I think most everybody has a little difference between each eye. There's, there's just one that's a little more dominant than the other. Sometimes it's more, more apparent than others. Uh, I have several friends where it's very apparent, some it's not. Mine's a little bit more apparent. And so in, in facing, if, if I'm the icon looking at you right now, what, what I'm looking at is, is at myself. So I would say it's this, this right eye, which would really be my left. This in an icon usually is the eye of judgment. And that's really interesting because I think a lot of people have a dominant eye on this side on your left. Probably has something to do, again, it's back to the physiology, the body, and the very material, not material, but just the whole created order that, that that's it. Then the left eye is a little less dominant. And in iconography, it's, again, it's my right eye, but the, the, the left eye that you look at is the eye of mercy. And for the longest time, when I looked at the icon I have in the kitchen, I'll, I'll compare the two, the one with the icon of truth with Mary and Jesus is different. But that one of just Jesus, for the longest time, all I could see was the eye of judgment until God's been doing a work in me. And the other day, I looked at it and I, I was shocked. It, it is totally reversed. Now the, the eye of mercy, the, the gentler eye has come forward and the other has receded. It's not, it's not as piercing. It, it's, it's still there, it's still part of it, but this is the eye that my heart has opened up to now. And it stayed that way. I looked at it today, I thought, well, that's not true, because I covered it up to protect it sometimes. It's in the kitchen, I don't want it to get ruined. It's not under glass. I don't want it under glass, but I have to be really careful of it. And lo and behold, it's still this eye. And it's the dominant one looking at me now. I, it's just something has happened in here down below my neck that is, is totally different. And it's really wonderful. It's called inner healing. And that's what uh, Lewis offers to us in his books. So I'm getting off track again as usual. So I'm going to show you three things that made my week. Besides phone calls and FaceTimes and FaceTime audio and this wonderful book. Thank you, Jack Lucky, again. So Abigail and Nathan and I have been reading The Artist's Way, which is a really wonderful book about creativity. And the garden that they created out here, allowed me, they allowed me to design it, and then they helped implement it, and then they added their own things. So it was like a family, it was a task, again, that we do together, and a task that has implications for building relationships with our neighbors, with each other, and friends. So that's, that's the definition of what this task is like. Jack says, is like it's, God gives us a task and it enables us to enlarge our relationship with God and with others. So that's what I'm um, onto tonight. This is a watercolor that Abigail painted out in the front yard sitting in the sun yesterday. And I had on, I showed the kids today, I had on a t-shirt that looked like um, some buildings with um, fire escapes on the outside in Brooklyn. And it's got it, Brooklyn Industries. It's a t-shirt bought at um, Brooklyn Industries that has all kinds of really cool kind of hipster clothing. And I, I love most of it. I can wear most of it. And n now that I'm my, my real weight, <laughs> I, I can wear all of it. <laughs> anyway, she said, oh, this isn't a very good painting. She painted the, the outside of our house. And I said, oh, it's very good, actually. And I, I, I said, it reminds me of something I'd seen. So I remember, this morning I pulled out the Brooklyn Industries t-shirt. It's almost identical to this, except it's a, a building in Brooklyn. And then Nathan said, well, yeah, you know, but this looks kind of like the wonderful surprise they gave me in France when we went last fall. We stayed in this amazing house. And it was where, um, was it behind the green door? It was a 70s movie, it was filmed. 
forget, it was, it was somebody really famous, either French actors. It was one of those art films that, we, uh, that I and all of my friends in my 20s went to see in the 70s, you know, or 30s. And I was, anyway, <laughs> a long time ago. Anyway, but this is a wonderful painting. It reminds me of our trip in France. It reminds me of uh, the place we, of where we stayed in France. It reminds me of this house. And it also reminds me of being in, in close to Rachel in Brooklyn. And we were all there together. So there are three different experiences where we were together. This is, a, again, a task and an activity that brings us into relationship to what God provided for us, the family and friends in different times and places. That's what I'm trying to get at, at doing some creative things while we're, we're in the midst of all this. The second is just the most fun thing. Uh, I have these wonderful cousins. They're the family we like to be with, not the family we stuck with. And if I can find it, oh, where did I put it? I just had it. Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's wonderful. And if I can't find it, I'll show you tomorrow night. So there's this beautiful, she may, oh, it's here. So this beautiful mask was a gift. It's just really beautiful. Isn't that nice? It's so beautiful. And it's all handmade and designed um, Megan, and I'm sure the kids helped made it uh, at their home. But when I got the package, there were lots of um, cards, really sweet cards from each of the children. I had sent them a kind of a fun care package while they're isolated. There's four of them and the parents and they're trapped in their home. At least they have a yard, which helps. But anyway, this card was stuck to the, the um, mask. So I had Nathan take a picture of it and tell them how much I enjoyed the mask. And it says, miss you on it. And it was from, um, let's see, who was this from? I think this was from Bethany, pretty sure. Yeah, I got one from everybody, but this was from Bethany. and. It just happened to be stuck because the tape on the outside stuck itself to the, the mask. So it was really a lot of fun. And we sent a picture of this today to them. And they watched the program this afternoon because I went through all the cards they sent me. I just thought it was so much fun and great and loving. And that's how we we're going to survive all this. So think of things like that that you can do together as a family. A friend of mine has the most complicated jigsaw puzzle out I've ever seen in my life. All it would do to me is have my ADHD just go off into a orbit. So <laughs> it's different strokes for different folks. So I'm going to get up now and I'm going to walk over. My, fam my uh, fire is still doing well. I'm sorry I can't see it, but I'll show you that it's still on to know that we really did do a fireside talk here. Here it is. Now I'm going to show you one more thing I forgot, and then we're going to go over to one more thing, and then we're done. This, I don't think I showed it on the evening program. This is a probably 18th century, maybe even early late 17th century needlepoint, and the the, it sits on a table, on a stand, like it was sitting here the whole time. And if you see, the, the thing that holds the banner is a cross. And I love this pattern because it's, it's a banner pattern, but it's, it, it, in some ways it represents the Trinity. Anyway, this is so beautifully done. My friend Greg Mitchell gave it to Twyla and I as a wedding present, and there's, there are beautiful beads. They're like jeweled beads, glass beads. And he repaired a lot of it because it was really, it's very old and fragile. And the purpose of this was to put in front, like this, to put in front of a fire because ladies in the 18th, sorry, here I am, ladies in the 18th century wore mac, wax makeup and if the fire was too hot, it would melt their makeup. <laughs> All their makeup would start drooping. It's like mascara running. So that was the purpose, it was very practical. But what's so beautiful is the back of it, 
it, it has a story and what he, he gave it to us because he said that uh, it was a really sensitive gift. He said that um, he remembered a story by the, the writer Corey Ten Boom. Some of you have read her. She, her family. We were talking today about how, uh, like people that go through a Holocaust or suffering, it, it embeds itself in their generational DNA. And when, G, when you know, in the scripture it says the sins of the fathers will go on to the third and fourth generation. It's PTSD and suffering does the same thing. And they've done tests just. Late, I've been reading on this. They've done tests on uh, the grandparents and uh, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of uh, Holocaust survivors or, fam or you know, our families that had victims and there is, there is a definite DNA physiological component. So a lot of this self-help book, it's an illusion that we can just help ourselves because a lot of our history, a lot of our suffering embeds itself in our body just like this. This experience is embedding our, itself in our psyche and will go on. Like my folks, you know, I said earlier, they provided and, and provided me a wonderful childhood materially and they never forgot. They had to build grit because they had to go through the Spanish flu, world wars, TB epidemics, <coughs> and when I was young, polio that, that avoided me. I, they thought for a while I had polio because one of my my feet drug a little bit. I may have had a mild case, I don't know. Anyway, but he, uh, Greg gave this to me because he said there's a story, Corey Ten Boom tells a story about after she survives the Holocaust, her, I think her sister died and her parents died and because they protected Jews in Holland and they discovered, the Nazis discovered it and they put them in uh, Auschwitz or one of the camps. And in her book, she talks about how this is how this is how God sees our lives. We're flourishing, and they're beautiful. Um, there's life pouring out and blossoming up. But the way we see our lives, with suffering and everything else, is like this. And I just noticed this. Look at this light spot there. It's just a tiny little stitched piece of fabric for to uh, fix a hole. It's so wonderful and it almost looks like, from here, when I'm looking at it, it almost looks like a little child tucked into bed in a crib, but a really cozy crib, not a prison like the one I was in. Anyway, it's just such a numinous thing. And uh, anyway, I always look at that and think that this is how we see it with all our broken threads and repairs and bumps and wounds. But this is how God sees us and this is how he created us to be. This is our Adamic self. This is what he's calling us to be when we use, when we do what he asks us to do by using these, not the self-portrait that we thought we should make of ourselves to distinguish ourselves from everybody else. So there's, that's the end of the lesson. I'm going to go over and show you one more thing. And it has to do with grit, again, a little bit. I don't know how the lighting will be on this, so we'll see. Sorry, guys. Oh. Here we go. This is a sculpture that I, I reviewed a little bit, but didn't really... There we go. This is done by a Russian artist, uh, a, a man who, um, here we go, that lighting's a little bit better. He left Russia in the 80s, and he's, he's quite a wonderful sculptor and was trained in the brutalist um, Soviet system. And this is a, a portrait of a man, and it's the mechanical, <coughs> excuse me, the mechanical man, the Nietzsche man, the man uh, whose brute power with a very small brain, who doesn't understand God's power. He's, this is the self-help, self self-made man. This is, and I was talking about <coughs> the greatest generation in our country and, and how in times we were redemptive in helping Germany to rebuild. And I think 
we need to look at this because most people today think that we're like this, that this is the brood, the Americans are the brutish world power, we're the brute man with no heart or soul or, or will to love. We just like killing and it's interesting it's, it's uh, a friend of mine said it's really shocking, or no, it's in a book I've just been reading by a monk <clears throat> who lived in France, and he said, you know, at the drop of a hat, as I was growing up, nudity was nothing. It was just a normal part of life. But then uh, in America, nudity is, is a real problem, and we have this puritanical strain. And but we love violence, we love, gun we, we love watching violent movies, it's just so interesting. And he said, in, like in France, nudity is matter of fact, but no guns. Nudity yes, guns no. Us, guns yes, nudity no. So we don't like being in our natural state, the way God has, has created us to be, we're afraid of it. And so we build our muscles up like this guy, trying to fight off everything, and even uh, his male part is small. So it's, it's a really interesting parable on the mechanical man, the, the 20th and 21st century man, like the, the, the great iron fist of China, of Northern Korea, of Venezuela, all, all kinds of places, not to get political, but it's, it's the man without God. And they can prevail if, if good men don't do things. So we need to step up to the plate and build our grit and meet the challenges of what we're in right now. So that's what I wanted to leave with. This is a positive thing. This isn't who we are. This is who we've become and we can leave it and become who God's asked us. As long as we're pliable and we use fresh paint, we can be what he wants us, not just anything we can be out of multiple choice. So that's what I leave with you tonight. And it's wonderful to be with you, my friends. And I hope that you have a wonderful evening, and please hug your family and your friends at a distance, it's six feet away, but those that are in your house, hug them. And uh, I will see you tomorrow at three, and tomorrow night at seven, and we'll be doing the first chapter of Prince Caspian. Thank you so much for listening and being with me tonight. Have a good evening. God bless.